The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. On this week's Court TV podcast, despite courtroom shutdowns across the country, the dating app murder trial continued last week, including Andre Warner taking the stand in his own defense. Did he help or hurt his case? We'll discuss his testimony and the jury's verdict. Meanwhile, a New Jersey appellate court overturned the murder conviction of a school teacher. We'll look at her case and whether or not justice is being served. Plus, coronavirus, Harvey Weinstein, and the Sixth Amendment. This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinny Politan and Seema Iyer. Welcome to Court TV's second edition of the Coronavirus Podcast with Vinny Politan and Seema Iyer. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing okay, but we are, you know, isolated from each other. And originally we were in the same room, but about 12 feet apart. Now we are miles apart doing this, but we're going to get it done. We're going to get through this. Like everyone else, we're doing our part uh, to socially distance each other uh, from one another. And and also, um, but but still want to, you know, get the word out that, hey, things are still happening in our system of criminal justice. And we're going to be here continuing to uh, get the podcast out. And I think it's important that our listeners know that there are still legal stories out there that are really important. And like you said, the justice system does not come to a complete halt and uh, neither will we. And yeah, we're in this together. Uh, How are you managing at home in your dungeon. Uh, we're doing fine. Yeah, we're doing fine. You know, there's four of us here, so we all kind of stay in our own place. We each have our own spot where we can grip the handle on the refrigerator. Okay. So I got the I got the top spot, and and then it goes down. So we divided the handle into four segments um, because that's where you're going to go more often than yeah. than any other place is that refrigerator door. <laughs> and I don't know where these kids have been. <laughs> You mean your you know children? I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know where they've been. So I don't know who uh, these kids I'm trying are. to I'm trying to protect myself, <laughs> but also protect them. Uh, but yeah, this is you know one of the little things that we do. We've got uh, plenty of food Good. and and these and these boys just keep on eating. So we gotta keep feeding them. And that's, what's that's uh, the real challenge. Well, what's the toilet to paper situation? How's the toilet paper situation? We are fine. We are fine. Let me tell you something, and, Vinny. In my life, I have to share this. In my life, I have not experienced the joy that I felt on Saturday morning when I went to the supermarket. And this was, so I went for a run, which is part of my sanity in this process is running outdoors, uh, socially distanced, of course. But, you know, usually you got to get the toilet paper. You got to get like right when they're opening. So 5.59 a.m., doors open. I am there. I am hoarding toilet paper like you would not believe. And I'm only one person. I don't know what's wrong with me. It's totally mental. But like a gift from God, I go into the store. It's 10.30 a.m. I don't even go down the toilet paper aisle, Vinny, because no way. It's too late. But then. It's depressing. Like a mirage in the desert, I saw a 12-pack. I have never, I, you don't understand. There is nothing in my life that compares with the joy that I felt. Well, it's a relief. So now I can go on. It's a relief. It's <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But I, right. I, I so, think, listen, I think, I think getting outdoors, are you uh, able to get outdoors and get some yeah, fresh air? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've become a social distance runner. Right. Exactly. So, you know, you run from from a distance. So uh, I think everyone's handling it. Everyone's making some sanity and you make the best of it. But as you said, the wheels of justice continue to turn a little bit more slowly than usual. But they are. And and the first thing I want to do, because we didn't have a chance to do this, um, yeah. was sort of wrap up what happened down in Polk County, Florida. In the case of Adam Hilaire, the single dad who was yes. shot and killed execution style. And uh, we ended up. Uh, with a verdict. Let's take a listen. We, the jury, find as follows. As to count one, the defendant is guilty of first-degree murder of Adam C. Hilaire. There it is. I mean, that's a... a and, and, you know, this is a defendant who took the stand um, and, and, and spoke. And um, he didn't help himself, Seema. I, I mean, this is someone who 
of many criminal defendants who have testified un unbelievably here on Court TV in our first year. Um, he was probably one of the worst. I hate people who get on the stand and talk about how they how great they are. And he was the worst about that whole borrowing of the car. Oh, yeah. If you need a car, I'm your guy. I'm there for you. It's just the kind of person I am. I am so wonderful. Everybody wants to be friends with me. Yeah, let's I take a listen him. to I Mr. Wonderful. Ugh, I hate him. We, we've got Go that ahead. cut for you. Let's take a listen. Fine. Here's Mr. Wonderful, Andre Warner, on direct examination, explaining uh, uh, why he was not the one in the car, but uh, Haley Bustos was. At some point in time, did Ms. Bustos or did Haley talk to you about barring your car? Yes, she did. Okay. Can you tell us about that? Um, I got back. She told me she wanted to go get some weed or some K2 at the time, and... She asked me to use my car, and if somebody needs to use my car, if I don't feel like going, I'll let them use my car. Uh, just the type of person I am. If you need somebody, if you need some help, I, I'm, I'm there if I can. If I can, then I can't. I call this the Houdini defense. <laughs> Friends, how many of us have them? Friends, I mean, this is insane. Oh, you need to get some weed? Yeah, take the car. Why not? I'm just going to take I a can nap help here you, at Evelyn's I will. place. Sure, no problem. Absolutely. No, I think what bothered me so much, and this is just legal strategy perspective, is that at the end of the case before he testified, I thought that Bob Norgard, his defense attorney, his lead defense attorney, had a really good shot going into closing arguments because uh, there, there were just a lot of elements in the defense's favor. I think they did set up that Haley Bustos may have borrowed the car and Andre Warner wasn't a part of it. Uh, then, of course, there was just no physical evidence, no DNA. Uh, the only problem, I think, was that jail call between him and his grandpapa, which is so disturbing. Hello, dysfunctional function family. Yeah, and, and I think, and I don't know who this guy is, Andre Warner. Uh, I do know he's a career criminal. Yeah. I do know that he's a cold-blooded killer. But I think in his own mind, he, he believes he's a little bit smarter than everyone, that he can bamboozle people. And, and obviously, people who love him like his mom believe him. Um, but but no one who is looking at this thing objectively could possibly believe this utterly ridiculous story. I didn't like the mother, uh, her interview. She spoke to our legal correspondent, Chanley Painter, and what the mother was saying was literally the entire opposite of this guy, Andre Warner, who allegedly, or now maybe it's legend, that he put Adam Hilaire, 27-year-old single dad, on his knees, begging for his life, invoking his five-year-old daughter, and then they were laughing about it. He and yeah, one of the co unreal. Uh, un unreal a description of what happened, and, and now we move on to the penalty phase, which is if scheduled. If we do, if we do. Right, it's scheduled for the 30th, and we'll see where the world is. Every day, things change, so uh, we'll see what the judge does and if, and if, in fact, these jurors will end up back at the courthouse. I'd be shocked, but I've been shocked before by, by how this trial proceeded through all of this. But didn't you say it was possible, because I remember you talking about this, it, it, maybe it was on the television, but there is a possibility that if, because of the pandemic, they are not prepared to go forward on the 30th, and they you know, whenever they go forward, they can't have the same jury. They could pick a new jury, right? Yeah, I, I believe they, they could pick a brand new jury and just try the penalty phase separately. But part of that penalty phase would be really retrying the case because the new jury wouldn't know all the facts. So you'd have to put all those witnesses on. Uh, but, it, but I've seen it done before in jurisdictions where people could be tried twice for the death penalty. Like if the jury was hung during the penalty phase, they could retry just the penalty phase. Well, in Florida, you can't get hung on the penalty phase anymore uh, because it's got to be unanimous. If it's not unanimous, then it's automatically life. Uh, but I believe if, in fact, at this point, they can't go forward because mm -hmm. of all these circumstances, yeah. uh, down the road, they can reschedule it, bring in a new jury. I'm sure the defense will object. And, and we're in we're in uncharted waters here to use one of the cliches everyone's using. Sure. Uh, but we'll see how it all turns out. Uh, the bottom line is we'll we'll be covering it for you and we'll let you know what happens because uh, it could happen on the 30th. It could happen, you know, six months from now.
Well, one of the small um, highlights or, or high points of this uh, recess that we're that we're taking from live trials is that you and I and the rest of our team get to dive deep into other legal stories. So I have a story, and this is a retrial that we should uh, be tracking on Court TV, and it's from your hometown. And who knows? I think you may have even been friends with the defendant. We'll talk about that next. For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Okay, Vinny, on the horizon, a huge case. I like to call this the Hot Mess Express, straight from your home state of New Jersey, actually my home state too. This is a former school teacher. Her name is Virginia Vertitis, and she just won a retrial after being sentenced to 30 years in prison for murdering her on-again, off-again lover, retired NYPD police officer Patrick Gilhooley. You know this case, right, Vinny? We were following this when before Court TV went back on the air, and it was one that you were thinking, oh, my God, I wish we could have cameras. I wish we could be on the air. Right, right. This, this is a trial that happened before we relaunched Court TV, and it was one that's like, oh, you know, so it's good. like it, it was just a little too soon, a little too soon. Like if, it, if they could have delayed it. But now we're going to get it because uh, of, of this appellate decision, which, believe it or not, Seema. Yeah, I think I agree. Really? OK, well, OK, before we hear why you may agree, I think which, I agree, <laughs> which I wish we this podcast was a video because you look so weird. OK, anyway, so. So let's talk a little bit about this case. So this is Virginia Vertitis, former school teacher. Uh, they lived in Mount Olive, New Jersey. That's where she's from. Yes. Mars County, right? And uh, Beautiful town. Oh, really? Okay, very nice, very nice. Oh, yeah. So uh, Vertitis, she was dating this guy, Patrick Gilhooley. He's a retired NYPD officer. Uh, they started dating, I believe, in 2000. 2008 and uh they stopped dating basically the night um he she killed him like that ended the relationship and his life on march 3rd 2014 yeah that's that's a deal breaker <laughs> Seema, in, in the relationship world that's a deal breaker <gasps> well okay these two were maniacs they were both maniacs there's like the on again off again the cheating the stalking uh the like wild sex wild sex uh lying uh when he when he died Vinny, he had a blood alcohol content of 0.28 isn't that like over three times the legal limit it is. And, that's insane. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a fact in all of this. And, you know, there's trying to figure out exactly what happens when two people are there and only one survives is extremely difficult to do. But one thing that jurors are going to look for are some of the other facts, you know, the circumstances surrounding all that. That's what we call circumstantial evidence. And, and that is a piece of evidence there. And, and, you know, it doesn't tell you everything, but it gives you a flavor for what may have been going on here. Well, the prosecution's case, and again, <clears throat> this went to trial. The trial occurred in March of 2017. And during the trial, the prosecution had a lot of evidence uh, to support their claim that uh, this was murder uh, in the form of statements that the deceased, Patrick Gilhooly, made to his friends, to his family. He was in fear of her, that, uh, you know, he would talk about, like, the relationship is just getting so crazy. Uh, and at one point, and this is so bizarre, she was threatening to uh, call the IRS on him because I guess he had unpaid taxes. In between asking yeah, him to come over and have is, sex, this is not uncommon, BTW. Though. 
She was like, hey, do you want to have sex? If you don't want to have sex, I'm calling the IRS. (laughs) What is wrong with people? And No, 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 no. Think about it this way. I've seen situations like this before. In your own life? uh, People from... Involved a very notorious <laughs> case from my hometown. I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but there was a bitter breakup between husband and wife, and the and, and the wife's way of getting back at the husband, who was allegedly cheating, was to cheat with some of his coworkers. But then she also ratted on the um, IRS with him. Oh, oh, that's that is very interesting. Okay, so this is what because someone who is close to you is going to know the things that you're doing. And anyway, to be so spiteful, and, and that gets to the heart of what this case is about. Yeah. Those domestic relationships get so volatile and so bitter and so utterly personal yeah. uh, that people will do things like that. Well, the night in question, uh, I, I I think, at, at least this is, this I, I think came out the trial, that maybe he was trying to end it, like he was getting to like the point where this has to end. So he goes over there and... Uh, of course, her she testified, and I think she testified for four days. So if she testifies again, we definitely have that to look forward to. But she testified for four days, and in essence, of course, she made claims of, and I say of course because this seems to be like the pattern of when you're going to do self-defense as a woman, uh, she claimed that there were prior instances of abuse. But of course, again, of course, she didn't tell the police because her claim was, no one's going to believe me. This guy's a retired NYPD, right? No one's going to believe me. So I didn't call the police before. So that's part of what she said. And uh, she also said that uh, the night in question, she was in fear for her life. And that just moments before she killed him, he had this look on his face of quote unquote, pure evil. Uh, So there you have it. Now, Again, this is her house. So he came to her house. He had, uh, it was his revolver that was the weapon. Plus he had other weapons, um, I I think other guns, excuse me, in his bag. This bag was found outside of her apartment. But the weird thing about this case is that she's saying it was self-defense. And what I think is going to be super, super, super fascinating is the medical examiners and the crime scene people who are going to be able to, you know, kind of give you the mechanics of how it happened and how it occurred was uh, the way he was like on the stairs and he was on the phone with his daughter, which is, doesn't reconcile with the fact that when he was found, his phone was in his pocket. So, of course, the prosecution is saying, all right, she put the phone in his pocket, whatever, couldn't be self-defense. But the bottom line is, jury didn't believe her, she was convicted, but now it comes back because the judge made a big boo-boo. What's that? Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's all about... It's all about the duty to retreat. Correct. The castle doctrine. Yes. Stand in my ground. And that's all things that I believe in. And I, well, okay. So, and by the way, I just want to direct everybody to courttv.com because I wrote an article about this and it's entitled Queen of Her Castle. And yeah, so the judge basically gave the instruction the self defense claim did not include this exception, duty to retreat. Right, and that's huge. I mean, back in the olden days yeah. uh, of this, these types of cases, um, you had a duty to retreat, which means, all right, you've got you've to exhaust every other way to get out of the situation before you can defend yourself, which is, is ridiculous, and the law has now recognized that that is ridiculous. So, of course, that's why she's getting a new trial. The judge gave the wrong instruction. I just want to point out to everyone, this is not stand your ground. There are different levels. Stand your ground is kind of the ultimate, where it's basically saying uh, you have the right to stand your ground in any place you have the right to be. So it's not just your home. New Jersey has this no duty to retreat when you are in your home and you are in fear of deadly force. So that's that, that right. kind of clarifies it. But it's a trial that we're tracking uh, and we're looking forward to that. But up next, we have the story that just keeps on giving. Harvey Weinstein, can't get enough of him ever. That's next.
Follow Court TV live over the air, uninterrupted. If you're watching television with an antenna, just rescan your channels now to add Court TV. And go to CourtTV.com to see the exact channel position and more ways to watch Court TV in your area. Every single day, there is an update on disgraced movie mogul and now convicted rapist Harvey Weinstein, who has also been sentenced to 23 years in prison. So from that prison, way, way, way upstate New York, we have an update uh, that ties directly into this global pandemic we are experiencing right now. Yeah. Vinny. This, this is serious. Weinstein this is serious. There, there, has there are, tested positive. Uh, according to the Associated Press and other reports, Harvey Weinstein has tested positive for coronavirus, although his legal team and representatives have neither confirmed nor denied this. Uh, this becomes a real issue now because uh, it, it's happening everywhere. And we know Harvey Weinstein already had two trips to the hospital since his conviction yeah. for chest pains. Uh, so he has some pre-existing conditions, underlying conditions. He's 67 years old, so he's kind of in the sweet spot. Oh, I think he just turned 68. He just had a birthday. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so he's. I thought you, wait, you wished him happy birthday on air, remember? No, Didn't I, did. you? I don't think so. I thought you brought a cake into the news. No, I think that was Ted Rollins. I think that was Ted. Oh, that was Ted. Oh, yeah, that's Ted. So, um, so you know, he's obviously a a, a vulnerable person, and and but the bottom line is, he's also a convicted rapist. So, you know, you you got to deal with it. But when you have uh, access to money like he does, I think you can fight a little bit harder than most uh, incarcerated Corona patients. Well, I don't know about that, but let me just give a little background because like you were uh, saying, this is what the AP reported, other news outlets, but his team isn't confirming or denying. So this is a little strange that uh, a medical issue would be out there uh, in the press when his team is saying really nothing, right? Now, when you're in prison, and you know this, uh, it's a little different than jail. So wait, wait, jail, wait, 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 wait. When you're in prison, wait, you know this. I've never been to prison. I'm a prosecutor. <laughs> I, I I used to put people in prison. No, I wouldn't go you know, visit wait, them. Wait, wait, wait. If I prosecute, you know I'm not procedure. visiting them. <laughs> No, <laughs> you know the procedures. You know the procedures. Oh, okay. I'm trying to explain yeah, yeah, yeah. something. Else. The procedure is okay. So in jail, you can call basically anyone. Collect call in prisons. You usually have to have people you communicate with have to be on a uh, a call list. You have to get on the list. So my point is. You can't, Harvey can't wake up one day and just say, oh, I want to call so-and-so and and call. They have to be on the list to get on the list. It's a procedure. The bottom line is, so Harvey's uh, publicist, Judah Engelmeyer, and his lawyers are all on the list. And what, what didn't make sense is if he tested positive and the report started coming out, he never called his representatives. And so even when the reports were coming out, his representatives had not heard from Harvey. So there was no... Uh, concrete indication that this was true. That's number one. Number two is all these reports coming out and everyone's wondering, isn't this a violation of his privacy rights? Uh, Medical rights. Uh, certainly it is, but uh, but there are leaks. There's always leaks. There's leaks everywhere. Everything's leaking. I mean, right. if someone and came so across what, okay. the information and gave it to someone and then all of a sudden people are, you know, confirming it on background without going, right. uh, you know, uh, by name as a source, then, then it's very possible. Um, but uh, you know, and why do you think money helps this situation? Money always helps. And it's not that you buy your way out. It's that you can have representatives like his incredible defense team and others, uh, turning over every stone attempting, uh, to get some level of relief from all of this. No, 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 no. What? No. You think he could just what hire Trapper John MD to walk in and give him some cure to coronavirus? No, not no, no. no. I'm talking about getting out of prison. I'm talking about him trying to break out. I'm talking about legally trying to get, uh, uh, treatment that he is going to, you know, use legal arguments and perhaps rightfully so, I don't know, to to get out that that a normal corona prisoner would not have access to because they don't have access to money. Pump the brakes, escape from Danamora, pump it, okay? What are you talking about? No amount of money is going to get 
some CDC treatment to Harvey Weinstein. He is stuck in the predicament he is in. He's not going to get out of prison on a 23-year sentence for a violent felony offense. Will he be put back in some sort of a hospital? Hmm? Maybe. Back in a hospital? It's a prison hospital. No, a prison hospital. It's not going to be, it's not going to be, uh, you know, uh, Mount Sinai or Cornell or, you know, some of the best hospitals in the country. Uh, no, he's stuck at a prison hospital. He's stuck in the same way that other people who don't have money are stuck and who, you know, who are sick. And, and, and you don't think he may have access to other doctors as well? That maybe a private no. physician no. for a certain amount of money may visit him at the at the uh, prison hospital. Of course. Okay. This, okay. Wait. Of course. Hold on. I don't. I don't think. So. I don't think so because I think that this right now, the prisons are all under so much lockdown. Like he couldn't even. He can't even get visitors. I think you know his friends, family. They were trying to visit him for his birthday. They couldn't visit him. So because of the coronavirus. So it's just a totally different situation. They're not going to get. They're not going to let another doctor who is in a hospital somewhere else, exposed to other coronavirus patients, come into their facility and potentially uh, hurt other prisoners. Well, he has to be isolated now. He has to be isolated somewhere. That's what they're. I mean, that's what they have to do uh, is put him in in a place. And by the, by the, the way, box. if there's any experimental treatment out there, if things start to go really south for him, if in fact he does have the coronavirus. Um, my guess is he'll he'll be close to the front of the list uh, of people who will get whatever experimental things that people are trying. Not if he is in prison. What are you talking about? I, he's he's not going to have that access. I, I really he, think he made his way this. to Bellevue twice while he was in Rikers. <laughs> so what is that? What is and that was for doing? chest pains. <laughs> now he's got like Corona. Yeah, but now, but now you think he's going to right? But I'm talking about people who would have access to a clinical trial or have access to other types of treatment that can that can give them money. Okay, so one thing that's happening now, which which you know, is that a lot of people because they don't want to wait for a hospital or their primary care physician to order a coronavirus test, a lot of people are going to private labs and even getting tests that are not FDA approved. And those tests cost money. And there are people who don't have jobs. So they're thinking, oh, am I going to spend $125 on this test? Or am I going to go to the supermarket and buy food for my family? Because we there is no money. People have no jobs. So my point is, Harvey Weinstein is in a similar predicament that he has no access to certain types of treatments uh, like other people don't have access to getting their own uh, tests. All right. Call, call tests. me skeptical, but I, I just think at the end of the day, he's he's going to be in a place getting treatment. I, I just think so. But we, we shall see. And I know you'll be on top of it, Seema, because you're on top of this always. On, I, you're the first to know. Yeah. Well, I, no, I'm socially distant from Harvey Weinstein now. I'm not on top right. of anything. Well, anyway, <laughs> the, the coronavirus clearly has had an impact uh, across the, the globe. Uh, but coming up, I want to focus on one particular way that it's really impacting our system of criminal justice. And, and the way I couch this whole thing really is like coronavirus versus the Sixth Amendment. We'll talk about that next. For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. So the coronavirus is impacting the way we live our lives. But, you know, here at Court TV, we're, we're looking at the way it's impacting our system of criminal justice. And, and really, the first thing that jumped out to me were um, all these orders being instituted by courts across the country. You know, Supreme Court of Florida, Supreme Court of different states where they are shutting down courthouses shutting it down to jurors, no trials, only um, the, the most important emergency 
uh, circumstances dealt with inside courtrooms and like first appearances, but but no jury trials. So uh, I'm thinking, no. wow, that's a problem, right? Because we have a Sixth Amendment that guarantees people the right to a speedy trial, the right to a jury trial, and those two things, Seema, are not happening right now. Because there is always the exception under the law for act of God, natural disaster. And that is what this falls under. I, of course, compared to anyone, I feel for the criminal defendant, the guy who is sitting and rotting away in jail and not getting his day in court. I feel for that person. But we are experiencing something that neither I nor you, n nor our parents, Vinny. I mean, I don't think our parents, right, from, from how old we are, our parents have never experienced, nobody's ever experienced what we're going through right now. You know, and, and it's like you have to stop, in a way, I have to stop talking about it because when you think about it, it gets so incredibly overwhelming. Uh but but let's let's look at it this way, all right? So, so the Sixth Amendment, yes, a right to a speedy trial, and that means different things in different jurisdictions, and there's ways to stop the the speedy trial clock from ticking. But how far can you stretch the Sixth Amendment? Can you stretch it, you know, three months, three weeks, six months, a year? Because now, for every week that goes by that cases aren't heard, there's a backlog. And guess what? Yeah. People are still committing crimes. People are still getting arrested but for murders. People are still being locked up uh, while being presumed innocent. So this, this all becomes a major, major potential problem. Well, I think... In general, throughout the country, arrests are down. But not for murder, officers. not for people that are going to get locked up, not for not for the most serious crimes. Yeah, it, yeah, you're, you're right. I, sure, I've sure, seen, sure, sure, sure. I've seen sure. videos of people, you know, walking into Walgreens and just taking things and not being stopped. I understand yeah, that's right, going right, to happen. Right, but right? I just I just think everything is down, meaning you're not going to be out there investigating as much. You know that you can't get a grand jury together, right? So let's say somebody gets arrested on murder, they do the arraignment, they're not getting grand juries. I mean, everything is down. The justice system has almost come to a halt. And I think, okay, so the standard is reasonable cause or good cause for the delay. So let's say, so you're saying, what is it going to be? Is it going to be three months? Is it going to be six months? Uh, I think it could be. be by the time things, even if, even if everything gets resolved, let's say in a month, okay, in a month, businesses are back, courts are back, things are back on the calendar. It's still going to take a few months to just regenerate the entire justice system. Yeah. Well, here, here's, here's t to me, the most, the, the most pressing part of all this are people who are in jail, right, waiting for their trial, right? Some people, you, know, you have a speedy right, a right to a speedy trial, even if you're yeah. not locked up. But for the people who are locked up and presumed innocent under our system of justice and have, and, and down the road, there, there is no trial date, okay? There's nothing happening. I know that that, that aggressive criminal defense attorneys are going to start filing motions to get these people uh, released pending their trial. And, and, and I don't know how the, how the system of justice deals with that because that's going to be potentially dangerous. Very I agree dangerous. With you. I, yeah, no, no, I agree with you. And uh, one thing that's happening in New York, I believe Bronx County is doing this, where there is a prosecutor uh, assigned to reviewing cases where defense attorneys and prosecutors are getting on the phone and saying, OK, this is a nonviolent case it's a nonviolent crime. Uh, let's you know, make a plea to get this out of this guy out of jail. And there are other jurisdictions that are allowing people to be released from jail. So there's this crowding issue with the coronavirus and all of that. Plus the issue is the backlog, like what you're saying. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, you're entitled to a speedy trial in front of a jury. And if you're not getting that, 
and there's no prospects of that happening, and you're locked up and you're presumed innocent, and you're locked up because you can't make bond. Maybe you don't have yeah, what, yeah. what and, and it exactly. could be a robbery case. It could be a sure. burglary case. Um, sure. And obviously, murder cases might be dealt with differently, but at the end of the day, it's the same Sixth Amendment right, and I'm just fearful that at some point, uh, if this thing stretches too long, uh, mm -hmm. that the Sixth Amendment is going to snap back at it, and you are going to end up with um, you know, people accused of murder who may get out who otherwise would not have gotten out short of no. a not guilty verdict. No, I don't. Th I, I just don't think that's going to happen. I think the people who are going, the defendants who are getting the advantage of this, for lack of a better word, are the nonviolent. Okay, so drug offenders, uh, maybe identity theft, fraud, those type of cases. Those are the people who are going to get benefits like plea bargains. Violent criminals will not. Absolutely not. They're, it's not going to happen. I, I just know how aggressive criminal defense bar is. And, and, and they have to be. That's the way our system works. And, and I think they all understand where we are now. But if we are here one month, two months, three, four, yeah. five months from now, it, it, it may change. But we'll keep an eye on it. We'll keep an eye on it. And that's what we're going to do uh, in this podcast because we will continue, Seema. You can't stop us. We can't stop us. Can't stop us. And we want everyone to know we will get through this. We're with you. We're praying for all of you. And, uh, oh, do we do we have to give the rescan thing? You want to yes, do that? Yes, now people for are home. For good old home. time's sake. You are home. Court TV <laughs> is on the air. We are still broadcasting trials. Uh, so if you have a digital antenna, please rescan it. You have time to do it now. It is so easy. <laughs> There's no excuses. Re and we're actually airing, like, the, our best trials, like our most favorite trials. Absolutely. This is like binge Absolutely. watch the other thing you do, heaven. If you want to binge watch something, go on courttv.com. There are great, great trials yes. there. You could sit and watch for hours. So uh, that's it. Um, we've got things to do here, folks. Um, I've got more work to do, more meetings. And, and Seema, <laughs> yeah. it's great to see you on the video. <laughs> it's great to see you. And I hope you are safe, Vinny, and all our listeners be safe. We'll talk to you next time. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.